I'd like to call to order a meeting of the North Miami Planning Commission. Uh, let us please rise uh, for the Pledge of Allegiance. May we please have a roll call of the board members? William Prevatel. Here. Charles Ernst. Well, he's not on the board anymore. Emmanuel Genti. Here. Dania Calixte. Here. Kenny Each. Present. Jason James. Here. Kevin Seifried. Present. Are there any amendments to the agenda? Uh, there's none. Of course, the presentation is uh, only. No, Mr. Chair. No. Uh, I'd like to call for approval of minutes. So moved. Second. Second. Minutes are approved. Uh, any communications? No. Uh, communications. Any, any communications uh, by and between the board members with other with third parties? None. None. Okay. I, I have uh, briefly spoken with Melgren Associates just on logistics of getting information to the meeting. Thank you. You may proceed, Mr. Chair. Okay. Uh, are there any continued public hearings? No. Okay. Uh, I'd I'd like to address an issue uh, that we have is that uh, we are very fortunate to have had reappointed uh, Mr. Kevin Seifried, our former chair and uh, a member of the Planning Commission for the last 25 years. Uh, unfortunately, there, because things were maybe done a little bit of haste last night, uh, we have also unfortunately displaced Charles, Mr. Charles Ernst, and hopefully that will be rectified. Um, but all of us see the value in uh, Kevin Seifried's uh, leadership abilities and ability to uh, be the chairperson for this committee. And I'd like to uh, make a motion or uh, call for a vote that we reappoint Kevin Seifried as the chairman of the Planning Commission. So moved. One second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone against? I make a motion that we appoint uh, Mr. Prevatel as the vice chair. Aye. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone against? Congratulations. Mr. Welcome, Welcome back. back. Yeah. Welcome <laughs> back. <laughs> and I'll ask my, ask this is, uh, this is my gift for anybody. We have awake tablets. This may go on a little bit long tonight. If anybody needs caffeine, even the public, you're welcome to take part. Thank you very much, Bill. I have to say these are not the circumstances under which I would care to have been <coughs> appointed chair. The commission is deeply going to miss the talents and knowledge of Charlie Ernst, and I hope we can find circumstances that will cause him to be reappointed in the near future. Having said that, We are ready for item five, which is the public hearings transmittal hearing for the ear-based amendment to the city's comprehensive plan. As a point of order, Mr. Chair, um, there is a, on the agenda, Roman numeral three, which is uh, a staff presentation regarding the HUD required housing five-year consolidated plan for fiscal year 2015 through 2019. And um, I, would presume that this board desires to hear this item first and then so that we can get back to the main course for tonight, which is the, the comprehensive plan. All Thank right, you. not a problem. Let's, uh, staff, let's have your report. Good evening, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, members of the commission. Uh, my name is Christopher Plummer, and I am a consultant with Ask Development Solution that has been contracted by the city to um, prepare two documents or to assist it in preparing two documents 
One is the five-year consolidated plan and the <coughs> one-year annual action plan. And what I'm going to do is just a brief outline of what the uh, plans are about and um, just take any, any questions um, after that. Um, okay, so okay, so as what is called an entitlement jurisdiction, the city of North Miami is required by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development to prepare a five-year consolidated plan for the use of federal community development block grant and home investment partnership um, program funding. The current consolidated plan that you're operating under the five-year plan is from 2010 to 2014. This new plan will track from um, September uh, 1st, sorry, October 1st, um, 2015 through to um, September 30th, 2020. And what this consolidated plan is essentially a strategic plan to determine, for the city to determine how it will use those federal funds um, to carry out housing and community development activities and meet housing and community development needs in the city. Um, the requirement of HUD is that this becomes, this is a community um, collaboration process where the community gets an opportunity to provide input and assist the city in shaping what the um, programs would look like and to help to reduce any duplication of effort at the local uh, level. The basic goals of the plan are three, providing decent um, housing, creating a suitable living environment, and expansion of, of economic opportunities. As I said, HUD, HUD expects that the city will use a collaborative and a consultative process, which includes agencies, um, doing research um, in the census data, looking at your comprehensive plan and seeing how uh, the goals and objectives of that plan will align with the, the HUD requirements. Uh, there's a requirement to conduct a housing market analysis and to do a needs assessment and then to develop a, a comprehensive strategic plan around that. As you are aware, the city is not receiving a significant amount. In fact, over the last 10 years, uh, block grant funds have been, been reduced um, more and more. I think at one point, um, you were close to a million, yeah. right, in funding, and now it's, it's um, a much lower amount of, of the amount. So um, it's critical that the community comes up with what's the best use of, of these funds to carry out activities and to meet the unmet and uh, unserved needs of the, the city. Basically, this is the plan format. <coughs> we look at economic and social um, data, assess the needs, look at homelessness, um, housing conditions, what's the ins institutional structure that will be used to carry out the plan, including the city's um, department and also including nonprofit um, community based organizations and developers and you are required to, to do an anti-displacement and relocation plan to ensure that um, with the use of these federal funds, persons are not displaced or persons and businesses are not um, displaced. And you are also required to incorporate any impediments to fair housing choice within the city and fair housing planning. Um, so that's a five-year plan, and essentially what you do is to take this year's allocation, 2014, 2015, and make an extrapolation, multiply that by five, and you lay out your goals and objectives based on that estimated budget of five times what your current uh, allocation is. 
then each year HUD is going to send you a letter based on appropriations by Congress saying that this is what your actual allocation is and the annual action plan is what lays out what how you actually spend those dollars based on the goals and objectives and priorities that you have established in the five-year plan. Um, and it, at that point, you're going to list projects that you award funding to, whether you award funding for public infrastructure, parks and recreation, your housing, rehab, and home repair program, or you provide funding to nonprofits uh, to do public services. That is where you're in your annual action plan, you're going to list your, your projects. You're going to look at whether you are targeting funds by geographic areas. You're looking at public housing, homelessness, also looking at barriers to affordable um, housing in the city. These are some of the eligible activities that CDBG and home funds can be used for. You may not you do all of these activities, but you do have the option to, to um, do them. The only activity on there that is a required activity is the home, uh, CHODO as it's called, Community Housing Development Organization, that there's a specific 15% that is set aside out of the home grant that has <coughs> to be spent on housing that is developed by those community-based organizations. If it's not spent in that manner, then you stand to lose um, those, those funds. Um, your current priorities as laid out in your consolidated plan is to eliminate substandard housing, um, existing housing, expanding economic opportunities, increasing the capacity of public services, and improving your infrastructure. Um, water, sewer, um, sidewalks, and, and so on, roads. And these were your current, these are your current objectives in, th in the last plan, to rehab 125 um, units, uh, unoccupied and rental units, provide rental assistance, and assist first-time home buyers. Each year, the city has to report on what are the actual numbers that were achieved based on, on these objectives that were outlined? Um, using your accomplishments from last year, these are the um, number of homes and, and other benefits that were provided to the community as a result of the use of these funds. Um, and this is your current 1415 allocation where you, you're showing the breakdown of what you spend money on. Basically, you're spending on economic development, public service, your administration of your program, which is a maximum of 20%. The bulk of your funding is being spent on um, owner-occupied housing rehab, and you had some funding being spent on public facilities. Uh, for CDBG, you now for home, you had money set aside for tenant-based rental assistance. Uh, the children set aside, as I mentioned, and um, again, you've spent the bulk of your funding on single-family uh, rehab program, and you spent um, a small amount on um, first-time home buyer program. So one of the things that we, we, we talked with staff about is that what you've been seeing is that even though you've set aside 40000 for first-time home buyer program, because of the level of income in your community, you have eligible persons who are eligible for the program, but they cannot qualify for enough, whether because of credit or because of income, to allow them to purchase a home. So you end up, in some cases, not being able to use those funds because um, of the nature of the clientele that you're working with. So you may then look at that, per that activity and say maybe we need to not, at least for one of the years, to put money into that activity. Because you may list your goals and objectives for the five years. You don't have to fund everything each year. You can decide that you may want to do small business assistance. So you may fund it in year two and year four. You may decide to put more funding in one activity in year one versus 
year four or year three. So you have a lot of flexibility in terms of um, how you can spend those, um, allocate those funding. And uh, basically the process is that the consolidated plan and the first, the first year action plan has to be submitted to HUD by August 15th. So our timeline is to present you as the, the review body and re recommending body to present you with a draft of the plan on um, July 7th at your July 7th meeting and then it goes to the council on um, the meeting of, of July 14th. This week we are doing some focus groups. We have, uh, this is a meeting where uh, people would have the opportunity to comment. We're having another meeting on the west side on Friday. We're having some um, focus group meetings today, sorry, tomorrow and um, Friday also. We also have some online surveys, a residence survey and an agency survey. We'll be giving you um, either copies, hard copies of the surveys for you to complete. And we have a flyer that can go to residents that they can just go to the URL, uh, URL, access the survey and complete it. So we get a good, um, we get good input from the residents as to what do they see as the needs and um, priorities. Uh, thank you. Uh, any questions, any, any comments? Um, Go ahead, I think we have a question from Jason James. Um, the, the survey that you're talking about, is, is that what this is? Uh, that is really, that is a part of the survey. The survey we're talking about is, is, is uh, probably a seven page and it's online. This is just something we wanted to identify the specific activities that could be funding and what did you, from your perspective, what are you seeing as those activities that are high need, low need, or no need. And that would, uh, as you can note from the document, a high need activity is an activity that the city would be recommended to spend CDBG or home funds on. A low need activity is one where you would not really spend funds on it, o or you would only spend funds if there are no other sources available. You would put, um, CDBG or home funds in it. And no need priority is one where that activity is being satisfied with private sector funds or other funds and there is no need to spend your CDBG or home um, funds on it. And what we'll do is just collate all of that data and get uh, you know, an average um, idea of what the, the community as a whole sees as high, low, and no need. Okay. And yeah. y you mentioned earlier in the presentation that there's some there's some line items that we allocated money for before, but we noticed that it really those items really uh, we didn't see much spending, or we didn't see much need for those items. Right. Do you, do you yeah. Let me see what slide it was. Yeah, she was the first time home buyer. Oh, excuse me, sorry. Oh, sorry. Your name, Marie, Marie, you. Marie Francine Ferenc, housing manager for the city of North Miami. Okay, can you repeat uh, the, your, your response? What did you say? Yes, uh, while he was making his presentation this afternoon and I kind of brought it to his attention, historically in the past two or three years, the money that we have allocated for the first time home buyer, mm -hmm. we have not really spent it because either the client did not have the credit or they don't make enough money to qualify for a first mortgage. So although the money is there, the need is there, but they cannot qualify. S and we have a higher need for the home owner occupied rehabilitation. So okay. I was asking him, is will there be a possibility that activity we can just reallocate that money on the side for that and then the first time home buyer will be on an as needed basis instead of okay. just allocate that money for that. Is that is that possible? Yeah. Yes, he meant oh. he told me it was possible. Oh that's awesome. Yeah. Okay. All right, do we have any other comments or questions? Hearing none, then staff may step down. Thank you okay, very much, thank sir. Thank you. <coughs> All 
All right, item four, do we have any continued public hearings? None? All right, then we move on to item five, which is the transmittal hearing for the ear-based amendments to the city's comprehensive plan. This is PC 11-15, an ordinance of the mayor and city council of the city of North Miami, Florida, adopting the evaluation and appraisal-based amendments to the city of North Miami comprehensive plan in accordance with the requirements of Chapter 73C-49, Florida Administrative Code, and Section 163.3191, Florida Statutes, amending the future land use, transportation, housing, infrastructure, coastal management, <coughs> conservation, parks and recreation, intergovernmental coordination, economic, public school facilities, and capital improvements elements of the North Miami Comprehensive Plan, adding a climate change element to the North Miami Comprehensive Plan, providing for annual update to the capital improvement element specific to capital improvement schedule, providing for data and analysis supporting adoption of goals, objectives, and policies of the elements, providing for transmittal and subsequent adoption of amendments, additions, and deletions to the goals, objectives, and policies of the elements, providing for transmittal of such proposed amendments to the State Land Planning Agency for review in accordance with Section 163.3184, Parin 3, Florida Statutes, providing for repeal, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, providing for codification, providing for an effective date, and for all other purposes. Staff report, please. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the Planning Commission. Good morning. I mean, <laughs> good evening. Good morning. Uh, uh, this is, is uh, <clears throat> the time, you know, to review the evaluation and appraisal, you know, uh, amendments made to the city comprehensive plan. And uh, he, it should be reminded in this, the comprehensive plan of the city is the single most important policy document of the city in that it really articulates, you know, uh, the vision of the city and then it also uh, allows for the, you know, special, you know, reallocation allocation of resources and then as far all, as well as, you know, <coughs> the appropriate use of land, water and uh, resources throughout the city. And then uh, starting with uh, 1985, you know, with the Florida Growth Management Act, you know, every city, every local mun municipality, including cities and uh, county, are required to have a comprehensive plan. And then again, uh, this comprehensive plan com contains, you know, elements or, with rec or chapters, you know, that deal with future land use, that deal with housing or recreation or open space, also, you know, water and, and sewer facilities or infrastructures as, as well as capital elements. <coughs> And they are what we call uh, some are required, some are also optional in the complaint. And also, on you know, the statute, which is you know Chapter 163, uh, establish you know mechanism for state to amend that. You know, uh, before the 2011 updates to the state statutes, you know, city was required to have you know evaluation uh, appraisal report, you know, and which is more a much lengthier process, you know, in when it comes to amend their comprehensive plan. Well, in, with those updates now, uh, uh, or city or local municipality only needs um, to the sta state uh, to the state to notify the state that you know there have been changes in the local condition or the local environment, or if there was you know statutory requirements you know uh, uh, for them to amend their plans. So uh, <coughs> uh, for to do this process uh, this time around, the city has all retained you know the services of. The initial planning group, uh, which actually did um, the evaluation appraisal report back in 2007, uh, to conduct you know these rounds of amendments. And um, and uh, without being too long, I mean, uh, I want to uh, clarify you know from the get go. I mean, um, there are certain needs and vision that have been expressed at uh, the, uh, public meetings, and then the planning commission also had asked for certain things. And then you know staff has tried you know. Uh, have done their best trying to incorporate some of those, but those policies that are being presented to you tonight are only recommendations. They are not set in stone, you know. You will have the opportunity to make recommendations, you know, amendments or revision as you see fit. Uh, but, you know, with that, uh, uh, the focus of this 
few bits, the amendments were really uh, the addition of a climate change element, I mean, which is really critical. And then we may be one of three municipalities, I mean, local governments in the state that have adopted that, you know, as part of a, or the comprehensive and as a new element to really address, you know, the impending threat of, you know, sea level rise and climate change and uh, as far as come up to mit mitigation and um, adaptation strategies to address, you know, these threats. And uh, <coughs> the second uh, focus of that complaint of the EBS amendment wa was also in anticipation of, uh, of the FPC, you know, state passenger station that is pro being proposed for 125th, um, in the city of North Miami for all about Florida. So we try also to uh, enhance the TOG policy, transit-oriented development policy that were in the code, and then trying to when we come up with our transit uh, overlay district, station overlay district to really, you know, uh, encourage a mixture of use around the station. Right now, uh, that transit is near uh, the industrial area. We don't, w the city has, you know, merely 1% of industrial land uses. We don't want to uh, basically eliminate that, that um, a use in the city, which is our major you know, tax waving uh, for the city uh, uh, generator. So uh, what we env uh, recommend that the city does at this point that uh, uh, they establish a transit station overly district that would, on top of the industrial uses, but would also allow a mixture of uses to encourage you know, a TOD development around that transit station. And, um, I mean, um, beside all uh, the economic uh, development er elements that is not really mentioned here in the report, because the city you know, has been making great strides trying to improve the downtown and then also trying to, uh, not just the downtown, but also the major corridors in the city. We have you know, also, you know, look, uh, uh, include policies in the economic element to address that, to try to spur growth and redevelopment within the downtown area along the major corridor and throughout the rest of the city and make the city of North Miami really a 21st century city, not just a city that is still, you know, living in its past, you know, with nothing going on. And then I, I think, you know, what would be the most important part of this uh, presentation would be the, all the issues of height and density, because uh, you, uh, members of the planning commission, have been asking for it, and then back, uh, that an increase in height and density. Back in 2007, when uh, the height of the city was limited to only 55 feet or four stories, really. I mean, may, maybe five stories in, in some regard. The, the city had proposed and it had made some great strides. They have removed that uh, height requirement, which was in the charter and into a referendum, and then which was approved. And then that would that open up, you know, your development rights for people to go even higher. And then uh, within the NRO that the city has created then, which is encompassing most of the downtown from 123rd to about 137, and from Fifth Avenue to about you know, Northwest and then to Northeast Ninth Avenue, to focus you know, development there and then increasing the height densities and intensities. And then, the, and then the height that was allowed there was up to, uh, was 110 feet by right and up to 150 feet you know, to uh, add the, uh, additional height bonus. And then the density also, which uh, was uh, increased to about 90 dwelling, up to 90 dwelling units per acre. And depending whether, uh, I mean, uh, it, there are some locational criteria that would allow, you know, a developer to come and apply for those uh, type of, you know, density, you know, bonuses and heights. And, uh, and this was done in 2007, and then we all know what happened with the market, you know, and then, you know, was, you know, bottom out, you know, the market crashed. So this, those incentives that were placed in the code to attract development and you know, spur growth, I mean, were not really tested. So uh, there was, a with, uh, within the NRO, there was a 5,000 units when the city looked overall, uh, given the density that was allowing many residential uh, communities because the city was not built up to that density. So there was what we call, you know, 5,000 floating or ghost units that were available that anybody, 4,000 were allocated within that NRO and 1,000 citywide, because anybody could have come and apply for it. But, I mean, uh, as we will see in the presentation, only a few developers came and applied for those units, and in, it was really 
in some of those developments didn't even pan out. I mean, because uh, you, you had that a year or 18 months for them, you know, to apply for when they get the conditional use a permit approved by the city council to apply for a building permit, and many of those developments did it. And then we still have a few one in the pipeline, uh, like uh, um, that was the Causeway Village, which actually came before you, and then that was approved, but still waiting to be heard by the city council. And then there, there was one recently approved by you, uh, which is right at the corner, 123rd and 6th Avenue. So this one was, um, it's in the making. That, I mean, that's a very, what a small development, only 21 units. But it's right outside here now where they applied to, they could only build nine, they applied for 11 bonus extra, and then which they were granted. And then they, they, right now this is, you know, in the next few months, they will break, break ground. And then there was another one on 135th, and it was approved to build you know, 41 units, but again, as with many other ones, they didn't apply maybe because of the market, and then now this uh, property, 135, is being redeveloped as a town uh, development for with 18 units, three rows of six. So this time around, you know, knowing that the city had 5,000 units that, available, that are available, and knowing that we have you know, adequate, you know, services you know to support that because you know one of the things in, in land use you know, policy you have to make sure that developments I mean you have to make sure are, are concurrent meaning that you know uh, available services are available at the adopted level of service you know concurrent to the impact of those developments and then so giving those 5,000 units are there and then they uh, we have the capacity to accommodate them instead of go do going um, a, a full increase in height and density I mean, we uh, think, you know, we see fit now, you know, we recommend that the city look at those five units and then, you know, 5,000 units, spread them throughout the city, keep 2,500 within the NRO, and then allow, instead of the 1,000 that was a, a previously allowed, a permitted for the rest of the city, now split it, you know, 2,500 and allow 2,500 for the rest of the city where any developer can come and apply uh, for those extra density. And then additionally, uh, we also propose that that the same 40 feet, you know, bonus height that is allowed within the CCD and the NRO that is also available citywide so anybody can come and apply. You know, of course, you know, this would have to go to uh, before you and before the council, you know, uh, subject to meeting all the concurrency requirements. So, uh, so this is how we uh, propose to approach in the situation uh, a momentarily, but again, a, a, those are a policy recommendations, and then you you guys can come and um, propose and amend as you see fit. You know, make recommendation to city council, and then so this is really uh, the basic of our recommendation. It's not that we're not addressing; we are trying, but we're trying to be responsible and then trying to promote sustainable development. And with this, you know, a, our consultants are here, and then I will have them, you know, come and do. Uh, dig further into those issues, and then they also have a presentation in, in for you tonight. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Staff, can we have the developer, please, the, the consultant? <laughs> uh, yes, good evening, Mr. Chair and members of the Planning Commission. My name is Michelle Melgren, and I am the principal of the Melgren Planning Group. I have a presentation here for you this evening to talk about um, basically what the ear is, what we were charged with doing, where we were in 2007, where we are now, and then to have a discussion about the height and density, because I know that's the 900-pound elephant in the, in the room here. So, uh, Basically, I'm going to provide the overview of the updated comprehensive plan. Again, as Nixon pointed out, the purpose of this meeting is for you to recommend to the City Council to transmit this to the State Land Planning Agency. And of course, as a planning commission and a leadership role if you have other recommendations that you want the city uh, council to include in the planning document we would certainly carry that forward to the council as well so what is an, an ear an ear-based amendment the ear is called the evaluation and appraisal report it's a an exercise if you will that's required by chapter 163 of Florida's statutes and the purpose is to ensure sufficient services and facilities to accommodate growth um, the ear has required and optional elements, and it's really, as Nixon indicated, it's a policy document, a tool to guide growth. You can see here listed the required elements. There are a number of them, 
and the optional elements, which is the economic element that the city already has, as well as a climate change element. Now, when we were contracted um, by the city to prepare the ear, uh, it was very specific in what we were to do to meet the statutory requirements of preparing an ear-based comprehensive plan. One of the um, first and greater tasks, if not a little mundane, is to go through the entire list of all statutory changes um, to Chapter 163 and Administrative Code 9J5 and compare all of those changes to every element of the plan and update the plan to reflect those changes in state law or policies. Uh, and then we were to um, update the economic element and prepare a new climate change element. So as I mentioned, the update is a statutory requirement. The year is done once every seven years. Uh, and as I mentioned, we look at the changes to state law and it's a tedious job going through every element, every page of the plan doing that. Um, our and the last comprehensive plan in 2007, our focus at that time, we were charged with looking at redevelopment and economic development. Um, at that time, we identified a potential expansion of the FEC corridor um, and passenger rail that had not come to fruition. It was just a concept, but we put in some policies in case that happened before mm -hmm. the next update. And we established a new mixed use and low medium land use categories and overlays um, to adjust for excuse me, specific land use uh, designations. So as the, uh, Nixon indicated, you know, we did the plan, it was adopted, and then the recession hit in full force, and all of the um, changes that we made to the plan never really had a chance to get uh, tested until this economic recovery really began. Uh, there are the three um, developments that have come in within the past year. They have not taken advantage of the height and density that they could have. Um, but at least the city is starting to see some redevelopment occur, and that is a good sign. So um, the, the focus of this update, the 2015 ear-based amendments, are several. Um, a reallocation of the floating or the ghost units that Nixon alluded to, and I'm going to explain what those are and what they do in, in a little bit, but it, the, the focus was to reallocate the floating units, to um, concentrate on the economic element and include some redevelopment policies, we were to look at the transportation element and create a transportation overlay district in anticipation of the passenger rail station on the FEC tracks, and I believe that that's supposed to open in 2017. Yes, is that correct? Yes. Yeah, 2017. Um, prepare the new climate change element, which we did, and uh, basically uh, incorporate capital improvement element and water supply update and kind of clean up all the goals, objectives, and policies of the other uh, elements of the comprehensive plan. So we talk about some hot topics here. Um, I mentioned briefly the, the, the um, rail station right on the FEC tracks is one of the hot topics that we've addressed in the comprehensive plan. Uh, sea level rise and inundation to climate change is another issue. We've addressed that through the climate change element that we're proposing. And just generally economic growth um, throughout the city of North Miami taking advantage of some of the assets that the city has to offer in terms of uh, institutions of higher education, uh, multimodal transportation, and what have you. And of course, throughout, we've tried to include uh, goals, objectives, and policies that will enhance the quality of life within the city for its residents and businesses. We had two public workshops. The first one was on February 26th. It was held on the west side of the city, and we got a lot of public input. The bigger the word you see on that is um, the more important or the more often it was mentioned in the workshop. The upper left corner you can see is how the citizens that participated see the city now, and to the right, how they see it in the future. The challenges are on the bottom left, and possible solutions uh, were listed on the bottom right. And we took some of these, all of these concerns that were listed in that first workshop and created objectives and policies to address some of them. Then we had a second public workshop, and it was held on the east side of town. And the, the hot topic of that workshop, the whole workshop, was talking about additional height and density. So I'm going to just briefly go through the major corridors and summarize where the height and density is now, just to give you a baseline. And rather than go through the individual corridors, I have a nice chart here that will summarize it all for you, which is right there. And I'm not going to read every single one to you, but I'll leave that up for a moment so you have a chance to look at it um, in terms of where the height is located and the density. With all due respect, we have a hard copy of that. Okay. Since that's so not really 
legible from here. Um, okay. So, but you have a hard copy of that. That's correct. Um, in the plan. Now, I want to talk about these ghost units or the floating units that you're talking what is about. The page number of that hard copy. I think this is just in our PowerPoint presentation. Oh, All right, so you didn't no, print no. that. All it's right. That's what it was. Yeah. May I suggest that in the, well, in the future, when we talk about the heightened density in areas, why don't we have a map up here that we can actually see? That would be, you know, I mean, yeah, display that w uh, and and we could actually point it out what where what height is in this neighborhood what heights in that neighborhood sure. it's a lot clearer and everybody has a better grasp of it I think I, I yeah. uh, er earlier today I requested that uh, that maps be distributed at tonight's meeting since they hadn't been distributed with the uh, packet uh, until now that gives us some graphic representation of, of what is happening in the city more than just a simple line diagram of where the street pattern is. So this might be somewhat helpful. It would have been even more helpful if we had it earlier, though, like a few months ago, to be able to react to this. Here, just look at my hand. Um, at the end of my presentation, I actually have a land use map that I can display, and then I can go through and explain what corridors have. If that, if you would that prefer that, would Mr. Be Chair. Preferred then, if you can do that. Yes, yes. absolutely. Uh, okay, so let me go on. I in was going to. In spite of computer aided design in the offices, yeah. we yeah. still can't get the city to give us good maps for these hearings. Right. Can we? Well, I don't think it's. Maybe we have uh, our copies. I think we have copies that's either reduced or in full size. Uh, yeah. Okay. Maybe we could lay one over the top here or something. <laughs> maybe one on each side if it's possible. It'll be some help. Thank you. If we can have our IT uh, person zoom in on the map so that the public can view these maps. We get two of them down, three up here. That's better than nothing. All right, let's go ahead and continue, please, Ms. Rump. Okay, thank you very much. So I wanted to talk to you about these ghost units that we keep alluding to. And in 2007, when we updated the um, comprehensive plan, uh, one of the things that we were involved in was a charter change because at that time, height was included in the charter. It was limited to four stories, as I recall, and we had a number of public workshops all across the city to educate the public about a referendum to take height out of the charter and put it in the comprehensive plan. And obviously that referendum was successful and height is now in the comprehensive plan. Then the next charge we were given was to do something um, to uh, address economic development and redevelopment. So we wanted more density uh, in the city but the, the catch is, is that if you increase density, and this is addressable, but I'm just laying out the groundwork here. If you increase density in your comprehensive plan, you must demonstrate to the state land planning agency, that's the Department of Economic Opportunity, that you have all facilities and services to um, accommodate the extra density, any additional impact. So we wanted a way to create or identify extra units without generating additional impact. And so what we did is we came up with a creative solution of looking at gross land area by land use category. We'll use residential as an example. We looked at the gross um, uh, land area of a certain residential category. We multiplied that gross acreage by the number of units um, that you could get, if it were two units to the acre, or ten units to the acre, whatever, and it gave us a total number of units. And then we tallied it all up. Then we went back and we did a lot by lot count of the number of units you actually have on the ground, and the difference between those two was 5,000 units. Those were what we call the ghost units. So we, we were able to create for the city a pool of 5,000 additional units without having to demonstrate any impact to the state land planning agency. We didn't have to do any additional studies or analyses to ac accommodate that. Effectively, what we said was we, we should be allowed to build this, we only actually built that, therefore the difference is we were still allowed without further work. That is absolutely correct. That's uh, and, and the state bought off on that and you had 5,000 more yeah. units. And may, may, I, may I make reference to, um, to your document on page, I guess it's page two or three, if I may read into it, regarding services and amenities. The city offers much in services and amenities. 
the citywide water, sanitary sewer, and storm drainage networks rank among the best in South Florida. The same is true for the city's garbage and trash collection system, free sidewalk maintenance programs, an extensive range and variety of recreational and educational facilities. It sounds rather promising from that write-up. I just wanted to bring it to a And if I can continue, attention. I'm going to get to that. Yes, it does. Thanks. And there, uh, there is, there is a, we can, we'll discuss that in a moment. So anyway, back at that time in 2007, the ghost units, as we call them, were distributed. There were 5,000 total. Uh, 1,800 were in the Central City District. 2,200 were distributed anywhere within the NRO, and an additional out 1,000 were outside of the NRO. And that's the way they were incorporated into the future land use map at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, the recommendation we have before you. Yeah, that's the, this is the NRO. And only, a th only what was that, 1,000 outside of the NRO? Right. That's a, as it is right now. What we're recommending for these 5,000 units is a redistribution of them where 2,500 would go outside of the NRO, available anywhere in the city of North Miami, and the central uh, city district would maintain 1,000, and anywhere within the NRO would maintain 1,500. The idea is trying to get some synergy or level of development in the downtown. Now, again, that's not, that does not um, include adding additional units. It's just dealing with the extra units we have without having to demonstrate that we have extra impact and, and addressing them. So there are some constraints, and these are addressable constraints, but again, this goes to having to demonstrate to the state that you have the capacity. In other words, you would have to do studies. And those constraints basically, traffic is one, but we can address that. The other is water and sewer. And at this point, if I may, there is a consultant here that has done work for the city um, from Tetra Tech. He can tell you a little bit about the water, the options that you have, because there is water, there's water available. Um, but he'll explain to you briefly the options and how that works, if I may invite him up. You may go ahead. Good evening, Ken, <coughs> Good evening, Ken Caban and Dave McNevin with Tetra Tech. Um, as far as the water system, <coughs> um, the city does have some alternatives for, um, no problem. The, the city does have alternatives uh, should it decide to increase densities or, or units, as Michelle was saying. The, um, when you say increase, is that beyond the 5,000 or is that up to the 5,000? It's beyond. Okay. <clears throat> um, and currently, right now, the city has its own water treatment uh, plant, which produces a certain amount. And um, it purchases another, the, the remaining deficit from Miami-Dade Water and Sewer Department. Um, Miami-Dade Water and Sewer Department could provide additional water um, should the city need it. Another alternative the city could uh, implement would be to, uh, to revive somewhat its plans for the reverse osmosis treatment plant. At one point in time before the crash, the city planned on um, building an RO treatment plant and it actually still has a permitted allocation, which is a withdrawal of water from the ground um, for treatment <coughs> beyond what it treats today. Um, so that's another alternative is, you know, uh, reviving those plans the way they are or maybe even increasing the amount that was permitted. You could re-permit it for even more water if, if the city needed to. And then a third option um, would be to um, <coughs> purchase water from another water supplier and because of our because of the city's geography the other water supplier would be uh, North Miami Beach North Miami Beach also has <coughs> a uh, water treatment plant and capacity and <coughs> it could purchase water from from that water supplier um, obviously those three have different um, implications and cost but also an impl implications in getting the water to where the planned developments would be. So on a big picture, this, the problem is easily solved, I would say, because water is available, either you know, the city producing its own or purchasing it from neighboring water suppliers. But the city would be required to do some studies to see how um, 
the routing of that water would, would have to, you know, basically what size pipes and pumps, things like that, w how we would get that water to where those planned developments would be. On the wastewater side, it's somewhat similar. Um, <clears throat> right now, the wastewater system has a certain capacity, um, and <clears throat> if that if the amount of wastewater that is going to be introduced into that wastewater system increases, then obviously you would need to ensure that your pipes that collect that wastewater um, can accept it, that the pumps that pump that wastewater into pressurized force mains can also pump that wastewater. Your force mains also are sized properly, and then ultimately your wastewater treatment plant where the city disposes its wastewater which belongs to Miami-Dade County, the North District Wastewater Treatment Plant, ultimately if that treatment plant has capacity. And like the water side, I'm pretty confident that, you know, that the wastewater system could um, see additional flows with some improvements. Now, the Public Works Department is uh, implementing a lot of rehabilitation that could better or, and lessen maybe some of the impacts for instance, they're uh, uh, implementing a, uh, an I&I &I program on the wastewater system. The gravity mains are old, they're cracked, which allow groundwater or rainwater to go into that. By fixing that, you're adding some capacity to that system. So the Public Works Department is, is actively uh, rehabilitating portions that would facilitate some of this um, increased development, let's say. But ultimately, you would need to, uh, to do a study to see what the planned growth is, where it would be, and how you would need to modify the, the, uh, the infrastructure to get that water where it is or to get it away from if it's wastewater to the plant. So, And that all presumes if we built beyond the 5,000 go ceiling. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And how about with regards to height? <coughs> would height have any effect on it or is that just gravity or how does that work with the... Well, as far as the height, I mean, um, on high rises, typically um, water is, is uh, transmitted to the high rise, and then those high rises typically have booster pump booster stations pump. that pump that water. So once it gets, we get that water to that property line and to that, that's kind of their responsibility on, you know, we just need to know we can get the amount of water to that location, and then they would need to, you know, their internal mechanical engineers for that high-rise would need to design a system within that high-rise to get water all the way to the top and vice versa. It's really as simple as having a tank on the roof and pressure feeding it to the floors below right. as they do elsewhere here in these 60, 70 story buildings that are in our neighbor, <coughs> neighboring mm -hmm. municipalities. Um, may, may I ask, if you have an understanding of, of our uh, general region, uh, I'm, I'm curious, how is it that some neighborhoods such as Bay Harbor and Bal Harbor mm -hmm. Uh, that seem to have uh, uh, boundless energy in terms of redeveloping and seem to increase their density and their heights. Where, where are their water and sewer services coming from or going to? Um, the water, some of it is provided by Miami-Dade Water and Sewer Department. Some of it is provided by North Miami Beach, let's say Sunny Isles. Um, that that's an area that has you know had quite a bit of uh, development and height. That water is I, some of it is from Miami Dade wa uh, Water and Sewer. Some of it is from North Miami Beach, Aventura the same. So again, water I don't think is really the issue. Um, I think the city could get the water it needed okay. um, either by purchasing it or producing it mm -hmm. on its own. It's just they have cost implications. And, and the wastewater treatment? The uh, wastewater. I, I don't know if they're doing it on site there. It doesn't seem like nope. it. Nope. Um, wastewater, is, uh, it all goes to Miami-Dade County, or there are portions within Miami-Dade County that are septic systems. In other words, they don't go yeah. to any treatment plant. They go into the ground. Are, so are we the only municipality that's using the uh, wastewater treatment plant north of 151st Street? No. That's a regional plant. And Miami-Dade County has three regional plants, one for the northern portion of the county, one for the central, and one for the southern. So most of the stuff in the northern part of the county goes to the north district. Most of the, part, uh, most of the wastewater in the central part of the county goes to the central district, and same thing for the southern. So when I, when I see these developments going on in Surfside and Bell Harbor or 
out there in sunny aisles and I see these 40, 50 story buildings, they're treating their wastewater over there at, in, at, yeah. at our uh, sewer plant. We, within, we provide within the them basically. Of the city of North Miami. So the clean water basically goes up through North Miami, North Miami. Miami. and goes across the causeway. And what we get back in return mm -hmm. is, um, what would you call that stuff that comes back? The wastewater. Oh, yeah, I don't waste think that's water. the word he had in yeah, mind. That's what we get from them. We yeah. get the wastewater. <laughs> the wastewater. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's what we get from them. <laughs> but meanwhile, they're allowed to really go to town pretty much, and yeah. yet we have uh, I'm, I'm glad you said that it's not a restriction, but it seems to be uh, constantly called on as being some sort of restriction or implied restriction. Well, just like the city's public works department, Miami-Dade County is also implementing a large rehabilitation program of its wastewater treatment plants and its water plants. So again, it's just to add to the fact that, you know, as far as wa water and wastewater infrastructure, I don't think that would be a roadblock. You know, I thank you for enlightening us. Uh, one of our concerns and one of the themes that we've been hearing throughout this whole process is that we don't have the infrastructure and therefore we can increase our density and this and that and so forth and so on. And it's kind of, uh, Mr. Prevatel, Commissioner Prevatel brought out a good point. Here we have <laughs> the sewage or the wastewater from other municipalities coming geographically into our city, into that plant up there which is located in the city of North Miami, being <laughs> treated, but yet we can't get our uh, uh, wastewater and sewage in there because we're told <laughs> that we don't have the infrastructure. Well, thank you for enlightening well, us because that <coughs> makes a, I, I really, comforting, I really huh? do. You really hit the nail on the head. Thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, you, you know, you do have to study it. You have to confirm. I mean, you, I don't want to say you have infinite infrastructure and infinite water, but I'd say within reason, things are, are doable. Um, we have, you know, the public works director and the city manager here was a former public works director who could maybe add a little bit or um <coughs> so. Aleem Ghani, city manager. Um, just to reiterate and, and probably give you some additional information, um, our consumptive use permit that I got three years ago, four years ago, was it, is a little over 17 million gallons. Am I correct? On the record, please, on sure. the record. Sure. If you're going to, yes, on the record, I, please. I believe Thank we you. have the consumptive use permit. A consumptive use permit is a, the water withdrawal permit that we get from South Florida Water Management. And, and this is to reiterate a point that Ken is making. I obtained a permit for the city, a withdra water withdrawal permit, which is over 17 million gallons of water per day. Nine... Point three is our permitted capacity for lime softening. That's the process that we have been using to treat water for the past four, for 50 years, since 1963, when that plant was built. So presently we have seven, approximately eight million gallons of water that can be extracted that we are not using. I want to reiterate that because when I made the council presentation, when I got the permit, it took me two years to get that permit in dealing with the district. And everything that Ken just talked about, the analysis and the gallons per capita and how many people and how much, all of that was looked at in close detail. We had all the analysis done. We had um, Hazen and Sawyer as the, as the engineers at the time who were designing the improvements to the water plant. And uh, what Ken said about going to reverse osmosis, if the development takes place, we have the permit already. The permit that I obtained when I was in public works was a 20-year withdrawal permit. It's there. It's in black and white. Very promising. Okay? Very, very, now, very comforting. Just to reiterate what Ken is, has said, I am not making any promises about our infrastructure. When you review a set of plans for any development, whether it's in height or in terms of density, you calculate the number of persons that is going to be occupying that dwelling, that high-rise, 
or that structure that is being designed. Presently, we calculated at about approximately 165 gallons per person per day. So it's easy to calculate. When you calculate that based on the occupancy loading and the density that we have for that development, if the infrastructure abutting that development is an 8-inch pipe and you have to increase it to a 12-inch pipe, that increase in size would fall upon the developer. Since I've been in public works for the past 19 years, that's what I did. So it's not a cost, if you understand the point I'm trying to make. Mm -hmm. The city has, we worked and we had, we had the vision at the time because of the boom. Biscayne Landings, now so-called Sol Solomir, was taking place. They had a 12-inch line already connecting with the understanding that they have to put in another line to bring the wastewater to the plant. So when it comes to capacity and infrastructure requirements, it's all calculated, the numbers are there. Your public works department already has a permit for an additional seven million gallons of water. If it is a policy decision to go vertical, increase density, then we have it all, we have the permit. Again, the requirements, I'm not saying that it, not, it has not, must not be studied, but the general outline for the increase and the capacity, it's there. Okay. It further has to be re-engineered to get all of the, the requirements or additional requirements as we talked about. And w I think it's, it's an important point, and I'm sorry to just barge in on it. No, I appreciate well, it. The point you're making is that developers generally bear the cost mm -hmm. of Thank you. those Improving the infrastructure. There, there, are, exactly. there are several mechanisms, if I may, there are several mechanisms that could be applied by the city to shift. The burden. I'm sorry, m uh, Mr. Nixon, it's got to be on the record. Sorry, Michelle. Thank you. Um, you can, uh, this, it doesn't have to drain the city's treasure. Uh, mm -hmm. There are certain tools that the city can use, like user fees, impact fees, to shift the cost the from developer. the taxpayer to the developer. You know, uh, on the economic portion of this, and um, I, I found it very interesting, and, and, and you know, I sit also on the CRA advisory, and uh, we have an economic development specialist, and we brought in a beauty parlor, that cost us 80000 we spent one hundred and sixty something thousand dollars for a restaurant. What the heck do we do? When I look at like an economic development specialist, I look like the ones we had up in Bolingbroke, and I just went back to my old city up in Chicago. And I see a Macy's. I see Fortune five hundred companies. I see jobs created. Beautiful landscaping. Of course, was put on the developers. But one of the things that they did to entice them was to give them a tax abatement. Tax Tax incentives. Okay, you put in the infrastructure, you create the jobs, and we're going to give you a tax abatement for the next 10 years. You should look at that in our economic uh, proposal here. I went back, and I don't mean to divert, but I, I, I went back there. I haven't been there in 12 years, mm -hmm. and I've seen a gorgeous, gorgeous city. And they did it that way, and we can do the same thing here if we think outside the box instead of so parochial that we have to get nickel-dime <coughs> jobs over here when we can get good jobs. Put that mm, in your Mr. Mind. Chair. Yes, yes. If I, if I may add, you know, I mean, uh, as far as what the Commissioner you just mentioned, because we do have an economic element, and that's all a policy that can be included to right. attract, you know, development, you know, providing, you know, tax incentives, you know, to developers, you know, as they come to the city. You know, in, in, in a way to offset, you know, the cost of, you know, the impact fees and the burden of the impacts that they have to incur if they were to come to the city to develop. So I, I didn't see it in the economic development. I was reading through it that it is in there. So you're so saying that that would be a, a possible yeah. recommendation from the yeah. Planning Commission when we finally get to adopting sure. these elements. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Can I, can I ask everyone understand that? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I do have something that will be a follow-up on the, on the finance uh, part of this and the the economics of it, but I'd like to, while we have the city manager here, uh, who said that we have the capacity for uh, extra density, extra capacity within our city system to accommodate new growth. Um, with that in mind, uh, do we have any particular uh, trouble spots right now within the city that we cannot provide for this neighborhood, this neighborhood, or this neighborhood, or we're pretty much, we're in control right now? Uh, well, just to reiterate, uh, your, your water plant is located on 
on the west side of the city. Right. And, and the whole reason for locating the water plant there, actually, there were two water plants. North Miami was self-sufficient in providing its own water. Mm -hmm. Because of salt water intrusion, the, the, the planning building presently used to be the operations, operations center for the first water treatment plant. That water plant was abandoned because of the amount of salt water coming mm -hmm. in. At that point, the city started buying approximately 3.5 to 4 million gallons of water from Miami-Dade to supplement. Your average daily demand in the city of North Miami is about 13.5 MGDs, 13 to 14. During the, the winter months, you're going you're gonna to be buying a little more because that's when the snowbirds and everybody come down. So you, we buy approximately 3, 3 million to 4 million mm -hmm. gallons per day. But it, is it not safe to say that right now the city of North Miami has sufficient water supply to serve the community, has sufficient sanitary uh, uh, ability to treat the water uh, right. throughout with this current density? With, with improvements to the system, to the infrastructure, right. it can be done. Okay. And keep in mind, our water supply system does not only supply North Miami. Okay. We supply over 85 85,000 right. people for right. water, which is outside the city as well. Okay, now let me ask a question, and this is open to anybody. Uh, does that mean that if you have an existing building that is beyond uh, the zoned density, then you can rebuild at that same density? Because most people, most lay people would go by and they say, hey, that building's coming apart. Why don't they rebuild it? And then you find out that, oh, maybe because it's, such as in the case of Mallorca Tower, where it's 100 and 19 units, if mm -hmm. you were and built 1969, if you would rebuild it, uh, you would basically get 24 units. You would get you know, a little less than, or a little more than a fifth and of that in density. Well, the answer to your question, um, Mr. Prevatel, is if, if the building was destroyed and needed to be rebuilt, it would have to conform with the current it's zoning and okay. land use plan. The question plan is, present. why is that? Why is the why is the destruction of a building? Uh, so instrumental, and yet we can accommodate that, yet the gradual deterioration to something where the roof is falling down and it, it's looking like an eyesore, it's a, it's a uh, financial burden to the people who own it, it's, a, it's an awful environment to the people who live there. Why is that when, in fact, we have that, that inherent capacity? Why would we penalize anybody from redeveloping? Um, I, I wouldn't call, I mean, it may be seen, be viewed as a penalty, but like Michelle say, it's a matter of conforming with the existing cause. I mean, if it was a non-conforming use, I mean, that's what, you know, if the building, uh, you, tore down, you tear down the building, for example, so you have to build it just like the South Florida building code. You have to build to the existing, the current cause. But if it's just the partial, you know, destruction, you still, that same density and height can remain. But, yeah. you know, but, you know, what we try to do, if even in uh, the, the, this uh, Ibis land use, if you go to to policy that deal with the, uh, with the non-conforming uses. I mean, we do have that. We do have that. Like, hear, me, hear me out. Yep. Yeah, I mean, we, uh, there, uh, uh, there is a new policy. Uh, we, we try to change that because what you have to do, you have to apply for vested determinations ap uh, application. To, I mean, once you get that, because to establish that you already have those development rights vested in that. So yep. now it's just a matter of you coming to the city and go to the city council to because yeah. we cannot do that administratively. Well, but the, the, the policy is in place to address it, you know, it, that very issue that you mentioned. You know, so many people have so much difficulty doing anything in this city to have another hurdle for something as ridiculous as replacing the density. Uh, this is, it's obscene. It's no. absolutely obscene to see something falling apart and mismanaged, whatever it is. And we want us, the city at the same time wants to say we want to have a better environment for these people or whoever's going to be living here, whoever's going to be commuting here, who's going to be working here. And, and something so basic as that and this has been requested of community planning and development on a number of occasions. I've requested of the city manager as well. I requested of Melgan Associates. And something as simple and logical as that cannot find its way into this work. Cannot find its way in. You ask anybody on the street going by, they could be a near absolute idiot, and they can go, oh, yeah, look at that. Yeah, they should take that down and rebuild that or do something bigger and better. And you already, as was pointed out, already have the capacity for that. I mean, we I don't mean, have the initiative or the, the mindset to, to actually acknowledge it and accommodate it. So therefore, what do we have in our city? We have three buildings going up, two of them already government subsidized, and the only time anybody's going to do anything in this city is if they get a pile of money from the government. 
and it's going to be the sh shoddy, the shoddy workmanship and and other things that that uh, that we wind up seeing. It's it's very uh, very disturbing that we, and and our council has has expressed such an interest in trying to improve our city. Yet this is just not reflective of what our council has sought. And I'd like to ask the question. Um, uh, Ms. Melgren, as, as you said, you were sort of, you know, you've been guided in this process Correct. by our Department of Community Development, I guess. Who exactly guided this so that there's basically no increase in heights or densities, uh, no stellar initiative to, uh, to really hang a hat on to, to say, well, how, how was this so stifled? It, uh, was, it was the scope of services that was provided to me. No, but what, what, what dictates, and, and, and also curiously, how is it that something that is of such a graphic nature, uh, a planning issue, and you could see this map, the public can see this map, right? There's, there's a lot going on there. Right. And yet, in seven years, in seven years, whoever was in, in charge here, community plan development, or, or it's not our, I don't think it's our council, but our Department of Community Plan and Development stops, looks around, and says, hey, that's working great. Let's do it again for another seven years. How did that possibly happen? I can't answer that question. I don't know. I, I want to know. Please tell us who, who, did, who have you had conferences with that have, that have done this? How do, we, how do we get to this point? Because uh, I've had tried to have my, my planning commission here has had to ask for input. We've had these meetings, these workshops, when time and time again, if people have made suggestions and have had very valid concerns, uh, very valid uh, input, and yet it's not reflected in this in any way, shape, or form. Uh, How is that? Well, as I said, Mr. Pravatello, it was a scope of services that the Community Development Department developed and provided to me, and it was very specific on what we would look at and limited in nature. So I can't, I cannot okay. speak to your question as to why, but what I can do at this juncture is quickly finish my presentation and sure. then give you some options to consider to move forward okay. to Thank address you. this. Thank you. That's right. okay. Um, now, before we go on, Mr. James, you had a question. Oh, yeah. <coughs> I had a question about the, um, the water treatment. You said we had the, uh, we're permitted to, Right now, we, in, we have permitted how many millions of gallons per day? Uh, I believe it's 17.1 uh, MGDs right so now. For our consumptive permitted. use permit. Right. But th there's, there's a little, uh, I believe, caveat in the e extraction or the permitted capacity. Um, lime softening, we have a 9.3 MGD, which is, which you, you know, you would know as an engineer, you mm -hmm. could only withdraw from the Biscayne Aquifer which is its official, which is basically from around 30, 40 feet, I would say around 30 feet to about 110 feet below ground. That's about the, the approximate depth of the Biscayne. Now, the second part of the permit with the extraction goes to the Floridan. The okay. Floridan is, you know, we're talking about uh, over 11 to 1,200 feet, the upper Floridan. Yeah. Okay? So this is why Ken had mentioned the reverse osmosis okay. plant. That's where I was going. <laughs> so in terms of treatment, we're going to have to change the method of treatment um, if we go to the Florida aquifer for our raw water supply. It's going to be a policies, policy decision based on what uh, the direction our mayor and council has give, you know, given. If is it, it the intent of the city to move forward, then I wouldn't say bold, but drastic, drastic steps has to be taken to improve the infrastructure. But I would say your permit is there already. Expanding and your infrastructure to meet your permit requirements for vertical and density requirements, it can be done. I'm not saying it, it cannot, it does not have to be studied. It will have to be studied, but the basic outlines, which is, and the most important thing is your permit and your withdrawal permit, we have it already. So the, essentially, in order to, ta to, in order to be able to use the maximum capacity that we're permitted to, to use, we have to ex expand, we have to build an RO plant, essentially. Correct. So are we already capped out on the amount that we could take out with the current 
water treatment plant? With the Biscayne, yes. We okay. are actually running the present plant, everything on the Biscayne aquifer. Okay. Yes. So we have to make a plant. If yeah, and that's, that's the reason why the lots were purchased. It, it came before the planning commission yeah. when the water treatment design came. Yeah. We purchased six lots. The intent at the time to purchase those properties was to actually put a reverse osmosis plant on the site. Mm -hmm. It was planned properly. In public works, I, when I started it, it was all planned. By the six lots, you bring in skids. When I say skids, as part of the treatment process, you go, our present demand is 13.5 MGDs. So we were looking at about bringing in three skids mm -hmm. to do that three million gallons of water. So we will be self-sufficient providing our own water at the time if you build that reverse osmosis plant. That way, we would not be buying any more from Miami-Dade County. As you have development and density <coughs> increases, what happens? The, the plant will already be there. The process would already be there. So we buy another skid. It costs you another million dollars. Mm -hmm. Bring it in. Sure. Put the skid in. Mm -hmm. North Miami Beach good. has it. Mm -hmm. Look at mm -hmm. any water mm -hmm. treatment plant that uses reverse osmosis mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. so That's so how you plan and you plan for the future. Right. It's not like public works or engineering mm -hmm. did not plan for the future. Right. We planned. So, so it's not a, not a, not a, a hard limit. It's just we work I with it. We, we, there are ways to remedy uh, our, our interest there and our right. supply. And, our, and again, I'm not saying that th th this is a cure-all. It has to be studied. Mm -hmm. But having a permit is a key. Getting a water withdrawal permit yeah. from the South Florida Water Management mm -hmm. District mm -hmm. is like buying gold. Right. I always say that. Right. Because it was the hardest thing for me to do when I was in public works. Yeah, it, it took it me it two it years to get that permit. Right. But it does seem possible since you have communities around us at Ventura and Bell Harbor and Bay Harbor and Miami Beach and Coral. everybody seems to be able to to jump that hurdle. And when was the um, when was the reverse osmosis plant? When was that supposed to be built? Because at some point, if, if my okay. memory, I'm trying to jog my memory. Right. I believe there was like a s allocation for it in the CIP. There was an allocation in the CIP, and if you remember, there was a downturn in the economy. Correct. With the downturn and development and everything crashed, so what we had to do, we, fa we, we pushed it forward. Rather than building it in 2014, 2015, now we pushed it a little further. Well, I think around this time it went, is when it was projected to start coming on stream. But at the time, with the downturn in the economy, mm -hmm. we, we did not move forward with it. You have a permit already allocated to do it. If you have density requirements and additional water requirements, it's going to take a polic policy decision from the mayor and council to move the, that project forward in order for North Miami to be self-sufficient mm -hmm. in its water supply system. Has it been completely pushed off of our CIP? Um, I'm, that I cannot tell we're you because we still I, I I Even if that were the case, if I may add, uh, the CIP is reviewable by the city on a yearly basis in okay. five-year periods. So, so well it's something that it comes up, we can ask exactly. It's That's something correct. that could be okay. remedied at the okay. very oh. next yeah. review, which is yearly by statute. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So why, don't, yeah. why don't we make a note of it? So let's. Uh, uh, Mr. James, if you'll thank you, Mr. Manager. Raise that question on the status of the RO plans when we do the capital improvement plan again, which I so think comes up in the fall. Correct. That's correct. Yes, if I remember correctly. All but right. I think uh, Michelle just reminded yeah. me in our five-year cap. I think it's off the five-year right. capital plan radar. So mm -hmm. if you wanted to put back in, then this is something that we have to revisit. Again, it's all a policy what decision from. Just just to follow up on the, the earlier thought, if it wasn't Melgren Associates, if they were directed by community planning and development to basically s keep this status quo, I'd like to call on staff exactly how did you determine that everything would be status quo? I mean, I, I, I look across our city, I could see seven, eight, uh, nine cranes and such. I see nothing, almost nothing going on here, uh, very little incentive. How is it that, that not a single thing really in this plan, because there was no need to even <laughs> issue this sheet of paper, no, no, no need to issue a, a paper like this with, of such importance, of such information with the packet. And I, I, am, I am baffled. I am baffled how there could be no interest, no curiosity. I'm, I'm, there's no change. How could that possibly be 
Uh, did you make that decision? Me, sir? Yes. No, sir. Who in your department, may I ask, did? Where did you get your, how did it come about that it was the status quo? Who made that decision? I, I, in, in, uh, I mean, I was at uh, the city planner when uh, Michelle Melgan was contacted, but I mean, I mean, I would think that would be a citywide decision. I mean, not the city administration. I don't think it would be fall on uh, the CPMD to make that such determination. Well, I, I know I've, I've gone to many presentations by the mayor who has, says he'd like to see uh, the city growing, whether the city on the move and, and all the improvements we'd like to make. I saw in the induction ceremony uh, Councilman Scott Galvin saying how much we need to increase our tax base and the what peril the city is in. I've spoken to Councilman Bien and me on a number of occasions saying that he wants to see growth in the city. Uh, Marie Serrell was, was uh, uh, I, I, in her last uh, week, weeks uh, of her term was trying to make uh, advancements to our plan. Uh, so how was it that, that this could be? Uh, it, it, it's, this is very, it's, it's, a, it's of great concern. It, it's, uh, it's to say the status quo is, is everything, you know, everything is fine is to say, you know, well, we really don't care. While the city just deteriorates and rots, uh, it's like someone fiddling while Rome burns, uh, Nero. Uh, and, and to get us to this point, and to get us to this point when there's now a deadline, you know, uh, days away, after we've asked for the 12, more than 12 months for this, um, it, it's, it's totally baffling. It's totally baffling. All right, Mr.